Um, it's time now to welcome uh, another speaker, Neil, with a very different, uh, a, a part of a very different kind of community, um, but with much wisdom to share. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Um, but Neil is part of the Wellspring community, which is a dispersed community based in Australia. Uh, and they seek to embody uh, witness and, and God's uh, presence uh, in that way, being spread out around the place. So it's going to be very interesting to hear about uh, going from a very, uh, you know, localised community to something that is uh, almost the opposite. So we look forward to it, Neil. Would you welcome Neil? Yeah, yeah. Can I just suggest that uh, you start off by uh, standing up and wriggling around? We've all been sitting for 20 minutes. And... I'm really worried that I'm going to be a great disappointment to you because last night you had two young people and we had um, men with bare chests, sweaty. Uh, we had uh, defenceless little women running into the middle of warring parties. Uh, it was so exciting what we heard last night. And then uh, we've just experienced, you know, a team of people from all over the world representing vast streams of knowledge and background have come and they've presented to you and now you've got me. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, part of the Wellspring community tradition uh, is from the Iona community in Scotland. We are not the Iona community, but that's part of our tradition and we try to be distinctively different uh, which I uh, may address in the workshop uh, later on. But we do honour and respect uh, and appreciate uh, the Iona community and uh, the, the tradition that we have been able to draw from. And one of the great parts of their tradition these days is the, the, the wild goose group who creates these wonderful songs. Um, and I want to begin just by reading one verse from uh, a song uh, by the wild goose group called praise with joy the world's creator it's a um, it's a trinitarian song and the last verse finishes up uh, which i think is very fitting for our gathering uh, this weekend praise the maker son and spirit one god in community calling christians to embody oneness and diversity thus the world shall yet believe when shown Christ's vibrant unity. So let's think about some more about community in a, in a different kind of way. As you heard, we're a very different kind of community. We're dispersed uh, right across Australia and uh, with, uh, with one person overseas as well. But what I want to begin with is thinking about how do we live in community or in fact, more simply, how do we live? And uh, Micah 6.8 offers one answer to that question of how we live uh, when it says that what does God require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And when I think about walking humbly, uh, one of the images that comes to me is uh, God walking in Genesis 3 in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. I imagine God strolling in his creation, enjoying all that he sees and looking forward to his daily encounter with the man and the woman. The scene to me evokes a sense of life, freedom, food, a place to call home, family, harmonious relationships and a stable natural environment. And I imagine the man and the woman in this setting walking humbly with their God. God, 
man, woman, in companionable relationship. And it's this sense of being companionable that I want to focus on today. Being companionable in community. In much of our thinking about community, or much of my thinking about community anyway, I tend to think back to monastic communities. And when I think of monastic communities, I often don't get the sense of people being companionable. My first thoughts are of people working in silence, uh, and I don't get the sense of the companionship there in their silence, or there's companionship with God. Uh, and I'm, although I'm sure that the monks uh, worked silently and companionably, uh, nevertheless, uh, it's, it's not the, the companionship is not the, the chief image for me. And the monastic literature emphasises that the purpose of silence was to be able to hear God more clearly, to hear God more clearly. Silence enabled the monks to speak more charitably and effectively to one another and to share the values of monastic life with one another. And this is the sense in which I, I don't get the, the sense of companionship. Monks were speaking to one another rather than with one another. And I don't get the sense of openness and mutuality that's expressed in companionship. And to help me think more about companionship, uh, I want to pick up on the idea of, of kindness. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Hebrew word of, of hesed. If we are to walk humbly with our God, we are to walk humbly with our companions who bear the image of God. In the Micah text, walking humbly is said in a context of loving kindness. And the Hebrew word for kindness, hesed, is difficult to convey in English. In part, it describes a the key element in relationships, whether in marriage or between friends or between God and humanity. So it's that which binds together people in marriage or friendship or between God and us. Uh, Hesed is often used in the context of a relationship where one person is in significant need of help from the other and help that may go beyond the usual expectation of such a relationship. And that's often, uh, that help is often essential to the basic well-being or survival of the needy person. So we've got this idea of, it's, it's, it's set in a context of being helpful and, uh, and going beyond the normal expectations of a relationship and meeting the basic needs of well-being or survival. And Hesed was evident on the Emmaus Road. Uh, two of Jesus' followers walked along, talking, discussing, sharing. Jesus came up and joined them, ended their conversation, and his words offered such help, met such a need of the two travellers, that their hearts burned within them. Jesus' conversation addressed the basic well-being of each person and perhaps even contributed to their eventual survival. They went on and decided to have a meal together. Real companionship is evident. Hesed, kindness, companionship, is a mixture of attitude and action, of feeling and behaviour. And I sense this in God's evening walk in the garden. He was there to enjoy the garden and to enjoy his creatures and his creativity. He was not there to instruct them or even to build them up in an intentional way. He was there to enjoy the relationship. And when he arrived, he missed them. So he calls out, where are you? In a sense, God needed them because above all, God is a God of relationship, of being, of sharing, of exchanging, a God of mutuality. Well, if God needs us, we need each other. In the community that I belong to, I'm always sad when some of our people talk about not doing enough for Wellspring. And I try to say that it's about being, not doing. Being with each other, being with God, not spending so much time doing things. It's about sharing relationships 
and enjoying companionship. And now I want to go on and develop this idea of companionship a little bit in the context of confession. In Life Together, Bonhoeffer stressed the importance of mutual confession for the life of the community. And I want to extend this idea of confession. Rather than confessing sin to each other, though, I want to move beyond that idea a little. Rather than confessing sin, I want us to simply confess, to share, to unburden, to talk, to open up a little, to share something of what is on your heart. I want to extend confession to companionship. And some people find this difficult. Companionship requires engagement by all parties. Companionship is more than one-sided sharing. It involves some form of response by others. Now that response may be reflective listening. It may involve an empathetic engagement. It may develop into a form of discernment. Above all, the response is an attempt to allow the sharer to reflect on the issue and to come to a deeper understanding of the issue. Hesed is integral to companionship. Hesed is a mixture of attitude and action, of feeling and behaviour. In this sharing, the feeling is the warmth of acceptance, while the behaviour is the active engagement. In our community, members of the community as opposed to friends, we have two ways of being involved in our community. You can go to a, uh, most people are friends, uh, but you can go to a deeper level by becoming a member. Uh, most members, or all members of the community, live under the rule of the community. And one part of the rule used to say, members account to each other at least once a year by the rule, uh, once a year, they count at least once a year in a small group or in one-to-one -one conversation of how they manage to live by the rule and specifically how they allocate their time and money. So our, there are several parts to our rule, but this is the part that I'm wanting to dwell on at the moment, is this accountability process where we account once a year to each other, either one-to-one -one or within a small group, of how we are managing to live by the rule and how we are allocating our time and our money. In recent times, we've removed the word account uh, and we now say, I will now encourage and support at least one other member through mutual discussion of our personal response to the wellspring spirituality and justice issues and the principled use of time and money. And so we've tried to some people found that word accountability, accounting to each other, to be uh, worrying. And so we thought, well, let's see if we can find another way of saying the same thing without this worrying word account. And so we now say, I will uh, encourage and support at least one other member through mutual discussion of our response to the Wellspring Rule. And yet, despite this, some members are still expressing concern about this accountability process. So the accountability is a difficult part of our community. Although the process is meant to be non-judgmental, it's meant to be a supportive review between two or mem members who self-select, they, uh, they aren't forced to, 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 to have a particular person, they're allowed to self-select, uh, some members find the process increasingly problematic. It's meant to be a companionable time when members share their wellspring walk with each other and mutually encourage and support each other as they go forward into the next year. It's not meant to be a time of confessing sins, failure and shortcomings, but a time of saying, this is who I am, this is my experience, in the light of my current context and what I've been able to do in this last year, this is how I plan to go forward. But this is also a time when others might listen sensitively and engage in ways that help the sharer to firm up the plan for going forward. So it's meant to be an engagement. It's not just a, 
a spilling out of what I've done. It's meant to be an engagement by others to help them to think through, perhaps firm up their plans more carefully, to reflect more incisively on what they have done in the last year. And so it may be possible that some of our members who are having difficulty with this process are part of groups that have not developed some minimum level of companionship. And this is what makes them feel uncertain about discussing their wellspring ways. So I now want to go on to look at companionship that's fulfilling. When times of companionship take place, they are truly fulfilling. My local wellspring group of 10 or 12 people meets once every two months for a few hours that include worship, a meal and companionship. We bring each other up to, uh, bring each other up to date with what's going on in our lives. When I lived in Sydney, we once saved the life of a member because we practised the discipline of companionship. One member did not arrive for a particular meeting. Because our past membership, our past companionship had been extensive, we knew that this particular member would make sure that she phoned to let us know if she could not come. And so over the next 12 hours we phoned her many times to see what, uh, why she hadn't let us know what was going on. We still had no success. Ultimately we were able to convince uh, someone at her retirement village uh, to uh, check on her. And uh, the office person eventually found someone with authority to e enter her unit where she was found unconscious on the floor where she had lain for almost 48 hours. And she would have died without our, our intervention. Now that's a very small example, an important example, but it's a small example of the fact that we knew each other sufficiently intimately. We had taken time over... over previous years to know each other's character and behaviour and by talking through what was happening in our lives we knew her to, with this level of intimacy and companionship that we knew we needed to act when uh, she didn't behave in uh, the ways that we had always expected her to. When our groups are working companionably people frequently comment that this group is the only group where they feel comfortable to speak what is on their mind. A few weeks ago, one of our group wrote that he had been asked if he had a group uh, to which he felt he truly belonged. And he went on to say, I thought of the local church, the Tear group, the Oxfam group, and these are good people. But although we don't meet often, it's the Wellspring group where I feel most at home. Thank you for the warmth and welcome that you offer. In our groups, each of us knows uh, that others may not agree with us, but we also know that we are held in respect and that our ideas are given careful attention. We know that the Wellspring group is a safe place and this sense of safety has developed because, by and large, Wellspring members and friends value the ecumenical nature of Wellspring and its interfaith exploration. Wellspring is a mixture of denominations, including Anglican, Baptist, Catholic, Mennonite and Uniting. And maybe others I'm not even aware of. A wide range of theological positions lie within that ecumenical spread. We have conservatives, and progressives, high and low church, supporters and opponents of the ordination of women. And we have fellow travellers who may not even hold a Christian faith. Like the Genesis Garden, many wellspring groups are places of hesed, of life, freedom, food, a place to call home, family and healthy, robust relationships. And although we don't intentionally use the word, by and large these groups are places of companionship. I want to go on towards the end by considering the idea of going beyond fear. The beauty 
that comes from learning com companionship within a community is that it equips us to be companionable with others. I am part of a non-Wellspring group that meets weekly and we have a process where we, we write for a while, we share our writing and we talk about the, what the writing means. One of our group has been experiencing some deep personal problems and they have been able to share within the safety of the group. Recently this person shared some particularly difficult experiences. After leaving that day, my friend sent a text that said, you have no idea how much that helped today. We need a safe place where we can be honest. And the listener and the hurt one both need fear fitness. The listener and the hurt both need fear fitness. And I believe that Hesed happened that day as we talked. Our safe place, our companionship, our openness and mutuality provided a setting where the significant need of my friend was met. We were in a Hesed relationship where one person was in significant need of help from the other. That help was essential to the basic well-being or even survival of the needy person. The text my friend sent referred to fear fitness. And I believe that my friend meant that we both needed a certain level of fitness, of resilience and of willingness to risk. We both needed to accept the fear that comes when difficult issues arise and then to move forward accompanied by that fear. In this companionship that we shared, there was attitude and action, feeling and behaviour. There was acceptance and empathy accompanied by moving forward, taking risks and accepting the fear, not avoiding it. Our fear fitness came from a history of meeting, of trusting and of companionship that allowed us to move to a place characterised by kindness. And from this I concluded that healthy community encourages growth in fear fitness. And so to sum up, with both my unconscious friend and my troubled friend, being companionable led to well-being and to deepening community. Companionship is built on attitude and action, feeling and behaviour. Companionship is built on acceptance and empathy, it builds trust, it's also built on action. It involves taking risks, accepting fear, willingness to respond and engage and to go where angels fear to tread. Companionship helps us to be angels. Although we fear, we step forward, trusting that we do not step on too many toes and if we do, we trust the kindness, the hesed that has grown between us will ameliorate the effects. Thank you very much. I don't know what you're worried about. <laughs> <laughs> Youth's overrated anyway. Um, we're going to pray for you, Neil. Thank you. Um, Sally, can I ask you to pray for Neil? Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Neil. We're grateful for all you have done in his life and that you are the centre of the Wellspring community. Thank you that you are the one who brings new life, who brings healing through the fellowship we have through Christ, through Jesus, the one who holds all things together. So, Lord Jesus, I thank you for Neil. I ask that you would continue to empower him and equip him and enable him to be your person amongst that community. And we pray for all those in the Wellspring community that you'd continue to bind them together, give them that fear fitness, that capacity of hesed, which brings them together and gives birth to one another in new ways of living, new ways of loving, new ways of doing justice, new ways of intimacy with you. 
So bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.